Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. The Supreme Court in London has been hearing arguments for four days over whether or not Theresa May's government or parliament has final say on how those Brexit negotiations will be undertaken when they begin uh, in March is the date uh, that uh, Parliament has agreed to. Uh, a lot of reactions coming in. Uh, we're with, uh, from London, Rory Broomfield, director of the Better Off Out campaign, joining us uh, from London. Also, Tom White, who voted Remain, former UK trade negotiator here in the studio. Uh, uh, British journalist Alex Taylor. We're also in the company of uh, Anais Rao who is with uh, a tech, uh, what, how would you describe uh, f fintech? Yes, so we are uh, rep represent fintech entrepreneurs. And so fintech is every innovation within the, f the financial field. Uh, so we have uh, payment solutions, uh, robo-advisory solutions to manage your savings online, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Business consultant Marina Niforos of Logos Global Advisors is also with us. Thank you for, for being with us. Lots of uh, reactions, I was saying, on the hashtag F24 debate. Political scientist Ruzbe Parsi saying, Brits are assuming it will be up to them. They seem to forget that the EU has a big role to play in all of this. Hashtag island of delusion. He seems to be against uh, uh, Brexit. And uh, we uh, saw that uh, that was definitely the case uh, when uh, Michel Barnier, who uh, is going to be the commissioner in charge of those Brexit negotiations, uh, spoke to uh, spoke to uh, reporters just uh, two days ago. Being a member of the European Union comes with rights and benefits. Third countries can never have the same rights and benefits since they are not subject to the same obligations. The single market and its four Freedoms, four freedoms are indivisible. Cherry picking is not an option. Alex, hey, remind us of those four freedoms. Freedom of, of, uh, of movement, uh, freedom uh, of, uh, of work, uh, uh, freedom to do trade, freedom for financial services, and uh, freedom... Of and that freedom of movement is, of course, the contentious one, because uh, it's movement of peoples. Well, movement of, freedom of movement is always treated in the, in the UK media and in the campaign as if it only happens one way. I'm somebody who's, who's, who's one of the, the up to two million Brits who've actually gone the other way, and we're never talked about because we're, 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 we're big, because of the referendum we could well lose all our rights so um it, 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 it's a thing which isn't really uh, treated in the in, in the campaign uh, as it should be because it's 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 a double it's a, a double thing and it, it's, it's something that we're uh, we possibly with the referendum denied um our children, uh, British, uh, future generations of British people won't be able to do what I could do, what I've been able to do over the last 35 years, which is live, be treated exactly the same as a French person in France. And there are up to two million of us in this case, and our rights have just been thrown out the window and, and hardly ever talked about. Uh, Tom White, uh, f your, your reaction f uh, to when Michel Barnier says, uh, says all of this uh, and that he reminds uh, people that actually, if you want the deal sealed in two years, you need to negotiate for 18 months. Is this just a bargaining posture or is the EU really going to play hardball? Um, no, I think what Michel Barnier's comments show is that for the last six months in Britain, we've been having a conversation with ourselves about what we want to ask for. And the reality is that um, a lot of what uh, people who were formerly Remain voters have asked for is is not going to be achievable. Um, I, I don't think a soft Brexit is something that can possibly exist. We're actually looking at what are the different forms of a hard Brexit that are out there. And there are a lot of ways that you can avoid it being a very damaging hard Brexit. And one of the interesting things that Barnier said on Wednesday was that um, some of the discussions around the future trade agreement may be discussed in parallel with the Article 50 negotiations, because that agreement can only not be signed until we're a third country, but it can perhaps be, be negotiated. So there's a lot of work to do to mitigate the economic impacts, but absolutely the position on the EU27 side is that you're either in or you're out, and we've, we've voted to be out. Um, 
that does mean that there will be significant consequences for businesses. Um, and I think the, at the moment we're in a bit of a, a phony phase where I think one of the previous speakers mentioned the economic uncertainty. And of course, that, that goes both ways in that, on the one hand, businesses are holding off on investment decisions um, because of the uncertainty, and that, that is having a, an economic impact. Um, but they're also holding off on making big decisions to relocate activities to the continent. But once we start to get some certainty, they will start to push the button on some of those expensive and disruptive uh, decisions. And I think one of the other things that Barnier said is that there could be a transitional period after the um, 18 month or two year negotiation to allow some adaptation. But we shouldn't be under any illusion that this will be a, a deliberalization and a, um, a set of decisions that have a negative economic consequence for the UK. Rory Broomfield, your reaction, we, we heard in part one of our discussion, Anais Raoult talking about British companies inquiring about uh, how uh, they can uh, uh, perhaps uh, do business, in some cases perhaps even relocate uh, to Paris. We saw the head of the French uh, financial regulatory body give an interview to the BBC on Wednesday. Uh, where he said that uh, they're uh, making a heavy pitch so that financial services move out of London and move here. Uh, what's your reaction to all this? Well, you also see companies, I mean, you've just profiled them there, with McDonald's looking to uh, move their uh, non-US tax base to the UK from Luxembourg. We see other companies such as Nissan and Toyota committing more money and further funds to investment projects uh, to go beyond any negotiation with the European Union in terms of uh, dates and timelines. Uh, so you have a whole range of uh, business interests being developed, and there are huge opportunities opportunities for us leaving the European Union and many companies, whether they be based in Europe or indeed internationally, are what looking at those opportunities and seeing that outside the EU single market and outside the regulatory framework that that entails, the UK can deregulate and become a global competitor, even more competitive than it is currently now. And so as a result of all this, we see a huge range of interests from a whole range of companies, whether they be already based in the UK or looking at opportunities post-Brexit to make the moves to the United Kingdom. Mar Marina Neforest, we've been talking about this on, on the show a few times, and one of the things that's being predicted, one of the reasons McDonald's, for instance, is moving from Luxembourg to Britain isn't out of charity. It's perhaps in anticipation of a tax war to come. When you talk, we talk about things going both ways, the whole of the EU might have to steal itself for a, a lowering of corporate taxes all around. Well, I think uh, even um, uh, the head of the IMF, uh, uh, actually at the closure of his interview, stated that we should be wary um, in Europe not to... Uh, have a regulatory race to the bottom, as, as it was called by some. That is, not to have a competitive war with a loosening of standards on financial services or on other auxiliary frameworks like the fiscal framework. But I would go back to um, the previous speaker's remarks about great opportunities ahead, which might be true, but I think need to be specified. And right now, I think what the businesses are looking are the incumbent businesses in the UK, that if in it's a concrete prospect in the negotiations that they would lose their passporting rights, giving them access to the, all the EU 27 European markets. That would mean a significant hit on their business. And considering that from the bulk of the UK financial activity today, about 30 percent is dedicated to EU 27 markets, that's a big chunk. And they would be highly encouraged to try to either set up affiliates somewhere else or to boost uh, a current uh, affiliate somewhere there. Anais Raoult? Yes, I would like to add also, we've talked about the regulatory issues, but there's also, we, we can also add another one, which is talent. I'm in London and the UK global, um, uh, more um, globally uh, attracted uh, due to a favorable immigration policy, lots of talent to have this um, financial industry booming. And we also today may wonder how, how is this going to come out? Because we do have talents here also in France. We have uh, and, and on a day-to-day -day basis, yeah. do you see, uh, do, are people saying what Rory's saying, that uh, they see big opportunities with Brexit, the British people that you speak with? 
Um, not really. I think uh, for f uh, entrepreneurs, uh, they are, uh, Brexit is a, is a huge deal, has a huge impact on society. And, and I think most of them are worried that uh, a fintech and, and financial industry services will just be uh, swallowed by all this political uh, drama and, and be actually kind of forgotten. So they're really uh, looking uh, ahead on, on wondering how will this plan come out uh, and 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 which delay are they, are they looking at? I, I, I spend all my time hosting debates. I'm hosting one tomorrow in La Défense, which is Paris's uh, financial quarter, which is, 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 uh, has got a huge campaign at the moment uh, to attract um, British businesses who want to keep a foot in the single market. Why on earth wouldn't they? I often think that um, Brexiteers spent too much time in uh, his kind of like history, nostalgic history lessons, and didn't do enough basic maths. I mean, it really is simple. As, as your speaker uh, in London said, uh, when you have 27 against one and you have the clock ticking, um, the 27 are going to win. It's a huge market of 460 million people. Uh, and so the, the conditions for Britain are going to get worse and worse. And simply because of the fact that after the two year, when you when you set off Article 50, if you don't have a deal, then tough, you, you leave. So that makes it very difficult for Britain to negotiate anything very interesting. And the, the problem with Brexit is that the real... Brexit thing hasn't started to hit yet. I, I listen to my, my stepmom, who lives in, in Britain, who's, who's one of these poor people who the Brexiters always say they're championing. Well, she rings me up all the time and says, Alexia, I, I, the, the prices are starting to rise already in the supermarkets. You can feel they're holding them down uh, for Christmas. But when you, you, you have the pound that's fallen by about 20%, half the products in British supermarkets, which are imports, inflation is going to hit with a big bang. All these poor people that the Brexiteers say that they were defending, they're going to have to pay for this. Brexit is going to really start to hurt in a year, in two years, in five years. And that's... Uh, that's when we're going to see the full effects of this. All right, Rory Broomfield, to keep that com political conversation as short as possible, uh, it's all about being on the same page and gets back to what we were saying at the outset over who has the uh, final say. We talked about a parliament that uh, has lost a great measure of legitimacy since most members of parliament on both sides of the aisle uh, were in favor of Remain. And yet, it was the Brexit that won at the ballot box. Shouldn't there be a snap election in Britain? Hmm. Well, I suppose that what is is what uh, the Parliament really has to decide for itself. If, uh, of course, the Supreme Court comes back and says that there needs to be a vote, if it uh, ties the government's hands and the government isn't uh, uh, pleased with what its negotiating hand is uh, when going into the debates with uh, the European Union, then, of course, the government would be... Uh, uh, perfectly within its right and to call Parliament to repeal the Fixed Term Parliaments Act and call a snap general election. Uh, but this is really what uh, Parliament has to decide. On the non-binding vote on Wednesday, it uh, voted to allow the government to invoke Article 50 by the end of March next year. And if the Supreme Court comes back and says but that... But the point uh, of that vote was also that it was forcing the government to come up with a plan. That was the point of that vote. We all know that Article 50 is going to be, uh, going to, uh, going to be made by the end of March. That, that's pretty clear. But the point of the vote yesterday was that the government can't just say Brexit means Brexit and we're doing Article 50. The point of the vote yesterday is that Parliament said we want to be consulted and that's going to, probably going to be confirmed by the Supreme Court when they make the decision in January. And if Parliament is consulted... Parliament isn't going to be fobbed off with some simple plan saying we're going to have a beautiful Brexit. They're going to want to know things before uh, Theresa May goes into Brussels on the 1st of April. They want to going to have some general idea, and that's only, that's only natural, because despite what you say, it's not at all clear that if we want to stay within the single market, and if so, under what terms, and so forth. And Parliament wants to be consulted on that, and Parliament's going to have to have some clearer idea before the end of March, before Article 50 uh, is, is, is triggered. Uh, well, if you allowed me to finish, I would have been going on to talking about the plan and uh, the idea that uh, the government has created this uncertainty, I think, is quite full of uh, fanciful because, quite frankly, it is the Remainers who have taken this to court, who are constantly looking at chipping away on the government's authority with regards to the plan. And ultimately, what this, if the parliament do tie the government's hands, what this really does is set a precedent 
precedent potentially for other trade deals. Now, the problem with this is, of course, uh, as the first speaker way back at the start of this debate said, the government would be looking at continuous litigation throughout the courts over many, many years. This means that the government's hands are constantly tied, and so the plans that so it you would don't wish like parliamentary democracy. You don't like the sovereignty of parliament. You don't. You don't want the no, representative of the people. No, I'm talking about, I'm talking about, about law. And I'm sorry, I'm being cut off by the speaker constantly without me being able. Well, this to is develop a debate. Points. Well, you're not allowing me to develop my points. So if I'm allowed Go to ahead, continue Rory my Brumfield. train Rory of Brumfield. thought. Thank you. Um, the point here is that the law cases wouldn't come from members of parliament. They would come from outside of parliament. And if we have set in train a standard where people can sue the government at a drop of a hat because the government has to reveal its hand every single time against convention that's gone back many hundreds of years, then as a result of that, we are looking for a potentially painful uh, uh, parliamentary process and a painful Brexit because of the Remainers and because of the people that want to frustrate the will of the United Kingdom and the will of the British people. Uh, Tom White, do you buy that argument? Um, I think there's a d difference between um, scrutinising the government as it goes through the um, process of negotiation and setting unrealistic conditions to triggering Article 50. And I think the former is completely normal in any negotiation. And there will be a mix of voices in Parliament through that process, some of whom saying that the government is being too accommodating towards the EU27. Some of them will say that the government is not being flexible enough. But that is normal scrutiny of a negotiation. What is risky in the current um, what's currently under discussion is that if Parliament attaches all sorts of unrealistic conditions, such as we want to have, you must be able to control migration, but you must also remain a member of the single market, or you must remain part of um, cooperation on security and defence while also um, reaching other, other commitments in the world. So that, that, I think, is the danger that Parliament is going to essentially set conditions in isolation of what is really achievable, which we're only going to find out once ministers start negotiating with the EU27, which cannot happen until we've triggered Article 50. And, and I think it's a recognition of that that has led to Parliament itself being a bit less... Um, uh, pushy with the government in the last few days and essentially saying that it will not try to frustrate the triggering of Article 50. And, but and, and, and just, just by the, the way, by the way, on this, Tom White, uh, it's not just one parliament. Uh, the, uh, uh, on the f one uh, viewer on the hashtag F24 debate saying on the final day of submissions, the Supreme Court is told uh, by one of the, the uh, 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 of the solicitors, the Scottish Parliament should have to approve the Brexit process 100% agreed. We also heard arguments that the Welsh Assembly should have its say uh, on the matter. And we heard very firmly the Scottish First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, saying that uh, uh, I accept the mandate for the UK government. She told the Irish Parliament a few days ago in a speech uh, the, to take England and Wales out of the European Union. I accept the mandate. But I don't accept that there is a mandate to take any part of the UK out of the single market, especially when we consider the economic consequences of such a step. Uh, what's your reaction to that, Rory? She's saying you may have voted yes or no for Brexit, but you didn't vote to take us out of the single market. Well, I can only repeat what I said before, that it was a vote to leave the single market. Leave means leave. And indeed, what was on the ballot paper was the United Kingdom rather than the composite parts of the United Kingdom, England, Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland and Wales. And so we as a nation, a state, a member state currently of the European Union, will be leaving the European Union. And that was actually made quite clear by the non-binding vote, admittedly, of Parliament yesterday. Even if it results in uh, a second independence referendum in Scotland, for instance? Well, what we've seen subsequent to the June referendum is support for a second referendum 
and support for an independent Scotland go down as people realise that the fear-mongering uh, that was happening during the campaign by the Remain side hasn't come to fruition. Yeah. It hasn't resulted. And as a result, well, we were promised a punishment budget uh, immediately after June the 23rd. We were promised uh, decreases in house prices, rabid inflation and high unemployment immediately after the June vote. And that hasn't happened. And it shows that the Remainers on this particular point have quite frankly, misled the, misled the people of the United Kingdom during the campaign and uh, should be looking we're, we're... to negotiate with the government and help to get the best plan for the United Kingdom in the negotiations with the European Union. Very quickly, because we're almost out of time. Alex Taylor, uh, just a reminder, Scotland and Northern Ireland majority voted for Remain. To remain, yeah. Uh, Wales and England rem uh, majority voted to leave is there a real threat of a breakup of the United Kingdom? Of course there is. And I think that the problem, I've, I've just said what you already said, of course it hasn't started to hit yet Brexit because we're still in the, in, in the single market. We don't know where we're going. I promise you, once Article 50 is, 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 is triggered and once, if this hits the economy mm. as bad as it could, then Wales and Scotland, the, the, the argument to become independent from England, which is, is seeking to get out of the, the, the biggest market in the world where we have very uh, favourable terms, where we do most of our, our, our business, there's going to be much more more of an, an impulsion in, 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 in Scotland and Wales to leave England and to say, well, we want independence now so we can stay in the single market and stay in the European Union. Of course it hasn't right, started to hurt you. It's going to start to hurt soon. It's early days. I want to thank you, Alex Taylor. I want to thank Rory Broomfield and Tom White in London. I also want to thank Anna Israou and uh, Marina Niforos. Stay with us, though. Our Media Watch segment is next. And we say hello to uh, James Creedon. Hi, Francois. So just to look at how this whole Brexit debate is playing out on social media and news websites generally. And you can see the division that we've just been hearing about uh, during the debate about the latest twist in the Brexit tale. It's very much visible online as well. Uh, these are images of uh, uh, protesters on front of the court. Brexit is racist. Stop. The, state, the scapegoating of immigrants, uh, says that particular poster. And you can see a lot of... Uh, Articles online as well, uh, critical or just of the MPs who voted to stop Theresa May's plan for Brexit, depending on what newspaper uh, you're looking at. Uh, the Telegraph is very much uh, editorialising uh, their coverage of it. The 89 MPs who show contempt for, the referen for referendum voters. Uh, now, that was shared on Twitter and one of the said MPs responded to the Telegraph saying, I'm not a childish vandal. So that was obviously a sentence that appeared in the opinion piece uh, regarding the MPs in question. I voted according to the mandate of my constituents and Scotland. And of course, as we were just saying, uh, Scotland uh, did not, if you, take, if you isolate the vote, did not uh, vote in favour of Brexit. 89 MPs who voted against the will of the British people next time you vote, remember them. So they're actually being catalogued in that particular uh, image which has been shared on social media. And uh, you also have a comment such as this one. This was prior to the, to the vote. The appalling mess of Brexit can be stopped by MPs if they put the country before themselves. Courage and principle. Do, do MPs still have them? So I suppose what it comes down to really is whether or not you think a referendum uh, should be binding in these sort of circumstances or whether the Parliament should uh, have uh, supremacy in that regard. So it's, it's, a, it's a much broader debate, I think. Uh, only one of Scotland's 59 MPs voted for Brexit, yet England is going to, to rip Scotland out of the EU anyway. And of course, we, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, indeed, is uh, potentially going to resist that. And the, what is being shared there is a, a newspaper headline in German uh, from June of this year, but it's being shared again because I suppose it's still seen as pertinent, where you can see uh, the English patient and sort of anticipating... English and Welsh. But <laughs> yeah, indeed. Uh, well, Wales in that particular image is staying uh, alongside England, but Northern Ireland and Scotland uh, uh, could potentially uh, be uh, sp splitting away, according to this uh, image. Uh, this is an interesting one uh, from a French presidential candidate, one of the more um, obscure ones, François Asselineau. Uh, and he's harking, harping back to the 2005 constitutional uh, refer a treaty referendum in France when Jacques Chirac called for a referendum. The French voters rejected it 
And indeed, it was sort of reformulated, repackaged as the Lisbon Treaty, which subsequently did pass. And he's saying, well, the British Parliament is respecting the referendum vis-a-vis -vis Brexit. The French Parliament betrayed the 2005 referendum. So as I'm saying, like a lot of the comment online is about referenda, the val val validity of referenda and uh, the, the consequences of them. Uh, just a couple of more uh, comments online, uh, Francois. You're seeing a lot of this. This is this again. This isn't new. Uh, That's what uh, Alex was talking about earlier. The and these campaigns that Anais was talking about. To, to tired of the fog, try the frogs. There you go. And uh, I'll just have to go pretty quickly through the rest because we're running out of time. Bloomberg apparently has predicted, uh, after being corrected about Brexit and uh, Donald Trump's uh, election, that uh, Marine Le Pen could indeed win, and that could lead to Brexit. In any case, way too early to obviously be. be uh, um, making predictions. I just want to finish with an ad, Francois, because it's really, uh, it, it, there is a relevance, I think, to the Brexit debate. It's a Polish Christmas ad. It's had over six million shares uh, in the last few days. And let's just roll some of the images because what you see is it's an advertisement for an online auction uh, website and it shows a, an order, a kind of grandfatherly figure, uh, receiving an English for Beginners uh, sort of kit, if you like, and it's obviously being sent from a family member in English in the UK. And uh, so it shows him reciting, learning English. He receives another parcel, which is a suitcase, so he's getting ready to go to uh, the UK for Christmas. And let's just play uh, the end of uh, this particular advertisement because it seems to be getting everybody uh, talking. Hi. I am your grandpa. So I guess it paints a picture of a very integrated modern Europe, multi-ethnic, etc. And in the context of Brexit, I think people are sharing it because they're afraid that this could lead to the end of that sort of spirit of Europe, I guess. Mm -hmm. All right, many thanks for that, James Reed. And I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France Vinquette debate. Well,